So honored to have this great choir and orchestra help me on this song for my brand new album. Babies are crying, people are dying, violence is the law of the land. The world's in a shake up, it's time we wake up. And answer to a higher command Fighting and fussing Screaming and cussing Never solved a single thing mm, Come let us reason Let's start believing It's time for us to make a change Good morning for another edition of The Mind of Christ. Uh, I'm glad you're joining us, and we are making our way through The Mind of Christ. Everything Jesus said, everything he ever did is being considered here, and I am making my way through the Sermon on the Mount. We are in the middle, actually kind of in the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount. We have a little bit more to go, and I'm glad again that you joined us today and would encourage you to to have your Bibles ready. I'm using the New American Standard Bible as the basis for our study because it's one of the most literal translations there is. So you might want to have a Bible handy if you don't have that version and be ready probably on this to, to pause or so that you can get in depth on this because this is an in-depth study. This is not this is not milk 
this is meat and we're just making our way again through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're following A.T. Robertson's Harmony of the Gospels and he divides the life of Christ up into different sections. This section is section 54 and uh, this is a number part number seven under that section. So if you are trying to keep up with A.T. Robertson, you will kind of know where we where we are. We're going to be talking about the golden rule today. So we're in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12. So let me read the text to you, and you'll see what we'll be covering. And we may get a little further than this. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and he who knocks, it shall be opened. Or what man is there among you when his son asks him for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. Okay. So we have three different sections here within this section. Uh, we're going to be talking about asking, seeking, and knocking. The second one uh, in verses 9 to 11 is a family response to needs. And then in, in verse 12 is what we normally call the golden rule. So in verses 7 and 8, how shall we understand asking, seeking, and knocking? It seems so definite insistence without qualification and it will be done so if you insist it will be done on the surface of things this just cannot be right god is not obligated to comply with all of our wishing and wanting and desiring we also see many examples of god not granting requests in scripture yet jesus says pray persistently. When this works out, it's wonderful, and it's a joyous occasion, and we all have had those experiences. But when God does not give or help us find or open the door, there is disappointment and dismay. But as with the Proverbs, there are principles in Scripture which, which generally work, though there are always exceptions. The person who is clear about what they want, where they have checked this against God's will, against his revealed will, and who prays with the motive to glorify God and who is persistent, normally they will see their request being granted, the lost found, and doors opened. But there are purposes and factors unknown to us that must prevent God from answering favorably at times, this might be harder to accept than the success when we pray. But this passage sounds so definite. He says here, everyone who asks receives. We have the advantage of additional teaching on this subject, and therefore we can see what else God says, just other than what's in these two or three two verses, three verses. But what would someone think if they only had this, or if they only heard this for the first time, and they had no context in which to evaluate this? Contextually, there is a divide between the Pharisees and just the common Jew. The Pharisees seem to be privileged and have a more direct and open channel to God. Perhaps the key to understanding this section of Scripture is found first in the word everyone. There is no privileged class with God. The common Jew hearing this would hear access. No going through a priest or some religious class. Anyone can ask, anyone can seek, anyone can knock. So who has access? Well, Jesus says everyone, no qualifications. All would include Gentiles. I'm not sure they caught this, but the message becomes abundantly clear even in Jesus' ministry and certainly in the ministry of the apostles. 
easy universal access would be revolutionary teaching to those Jews that were listening to Jesus. They had years of believing the priesthood and its related political system which attached itself to it was the sole channel to God. The priesthood was never intended by God to limit access but to foreshadow the work of Christ who opened the access for all. Ephesians 2 teaches this. It says, For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. We are becoming together with all the saints a temple where God lives by his spirit. Speaking directly with God, or as we often say in response to the Catholic system, the priesthood of all believers, was a major shift of the Reformation, which they began to take on the hierarchical system uh, that was embodied in the clergy and the laity. I believe our focus in this section has been on whether or not I can get anything I want from God. It should be the amazing truth that I and anyone else has unrestricted access to God. Jesus has torn the curtain. Hebrews says, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart. Jesus reverses this in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, as he is the one who is doing the knocking on the door. But again, he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, then he says, I will come in and I will have supper with him. We also have to give him access into our lives when he asks, does he receive? When he asks for access into our life, does he receive it? When he seeks, does he find? And when he knocks, does the door open to him? Now, he turns his attention to this idea of even evil men can and do produce good fruit. They can give good gifts to their children. But Jesus says it's evil and bad trees produce bad fruit. Only good trees produce good fruit. So what is this? I think this is what confuses us. All fruit is not equal. Atheists may do good to their fellow man for whatever good motive they have, but they still are atheists and they cannot produce the kind of fruit that God desires. Fruit can be tasteful, but not beneficial. In the garden, all the trees produce good fruit, and even the tree of knowledge of good and evil was pleasant to the sight and to the taste, but it produced the knowledge that made sin possible. Where there is no law, there is no sin, and what made this tree different than the others was the prohibition that God attached to it. Don't eat it or you will die. In this way, the tree is the first law. The law cannot say, but only make us aware of sin. And that's what happened with this tree. There is nothing inherently wrong with the law or with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is it's just is the fruit. It's, it's, not, it's not able to save. The evil man who does good to his children by giving them food instead of stones or snakes cannot be saved by doing so. This is not the fruit of God is looking for. In Matthew 3, 8, says he is looking for the fruit of repentance, a change of heart which includes our view of Jesus. It is telling in Matthew 21 and verse 43 that Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. In John chapter 4 and verse 36, calls it fruit of for eternal life. In John 12, 24 says it is fruit born out of death. It is fruit born by abiding in the vine, according to John 15, verses 4 and 5, without which one can do nothing. Romans 7, verse 4 says, oh, when, we, when we are released from the law, we are now able to bear fruit in our new relationship with Jesus. The law only arouses passions 
that bear the fruit of death. The fruit has nine characteristics according to Galatians chapter 5, verses 9 and following. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Philippians 1 and verse 11 says, It is the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus. This requires wisdom, lest we are deceived. Now the how much more phrase found in this passage. We're still looking at the verses here. So the how much more phrase is meant to contrast and compare God with us and even evil men among us. So if evil men know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We don't usually play cruel jokes on our kids. We don't give stones for bread or snakes for fish. This phrase is found throughout the Old Testament as well, this how much more phrase. In 2 Samuel 4 and verse 11, when one destroys the life of a righteous man lying on his bed, how much more should the life of the destroyer be destroyed? In 2 Kings 5 and verse 13, as the servant speaks to Naaman about his eagerness to do a hard thing to get well, he says, how much more should he have done the easy thing? In Proverbs 11 and verse 31, if the righteous man is rewarded on the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? In Proverbs 15 and verse 11, Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of men? In Proverbs 21 and verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with an evil intent? So that phrase, how much more, you can find it many places in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in Matthew 10 and verse 25, Jesus says, It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, then how much more will they malign the members of his household? And then in Luke 12 and verse 28, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the fiery furnace, how much more will he clothe you? Also in Luke 12 and verse 24 about feeding the ravens, a similar passage. In Romans 11 and verse 12, If the transgression of the Jews is riches for the Gentile, or the Gentiles or the world, then how much more will their fulfillment be. And so he, he uses this phrase quite often. You can also see Romans 11 and verse 24. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 3, he says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? And then he says, Well, how much more should we judge the matters of this life when there are disputes between brothers? And then Philemon 1 and verse 16, the phrase is used, Onesimus was how much more to Philemon after his conversion. And so if, if he was something to Philemon as a slave, then how much more now that he is a Christian brother? Hebrews 9 and verse 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ cleanse our consciences? And so, again, you see this phrase found quite often. But notice Luke 11 and verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? God as Father is eager to give us not just bread and fish, which Jesus did in feeding the 4,000 and the 5,000, but how much more giving us the Holy Spirit if we ask Him. This is according to John for the living water. So how much more is an indicator to our being created in the image of God? We are able to understand and imitate acts similar to God, but on a much more limited basis. Our incompleteness compared to his fullness. We find benevolence in our hearts and know that there is infinite benevolence in the heart of God. We can understand who he is and what he expects of us, at least to some extent, because we know how to do 
very similar things. We can do good. And so we can understand the good that God does because it is something we can imitate. But this also connects us with the others. Here is where the golden rule comes in. This so-called rule is not unique to Jesus, by the way. It is called the ethic of reciprocity. Confucius says, never impose on others what you would not choose for yourself. From ancient Egypt, they had a saying, that which you hate to be done to you, do not do to another. And the ancient Greeks had this saying, do not to your neighbor what you would take ill from him. The Declaration Towards a Global Ethic, written in the Parliament of the World's Religions, proclaimed this the common principle for many religions. And so even in our day, People recognize what we call the golden rule to be one of the most universally applicable rules, if you will, or sayings in any religion of the world. It is one of the things that we have in common with even people who are not Christians. Rather than distress us that others spoke this principle, it is a testimony to its truth. A truth that can be universally recognized across the years and cultures as valid. This is so because truth can be found in the heart. It is, as we say, it rings true. Some truths are self-evident. And now the application of this and other truths may be more difficult. And let's see where we go with this. So how do I want to be treated? How do I want to be treated? Ideally, within my better nature, with respect, with love, with truth, with faithfulness, with care, those are all ways I want to be treated. These are adjunct to the content of one's belief or situations or choices. We do not treat others according to how they treat us. This would be lex talion the law of retaliation. Do unto others as they have done to us. That's not the golden rule. This is vengeance. It's getting back. It's trying to get even. But we treat others as we would like to be treated regardless of how they have treated us takes much more discipline and wisdom. So contextually, the golden rule could be applied to us and to God. We could say, treat God the way you want him to treat you. What if God did that? We set the standard, minute by minute, day by day. What would that look like? If we did the same with people, this would be an even messier world than it is now. There would be little consistency in the world. It would be reactive morality, popcorn behavior. One moment, I'm being nice to someone who was nice to me. And the next moment, I'm being nasty to someone who was nasty to me. It reminds me of my brother, Willie, who was predictable in some ways. Those who were nice to him, he was nice to them. Those he thought were not nice to him, he was not nice to them. And there is no order in this. And eventually, this will result in a complete breakdown of society like an, in a nuclear reactor. It will be a meltdown if practiced as intended to truly treat everyone as we want or need to be treated. What would that do? It would elevate society to a higher level. People would be dragged upward if we actually followed the golden rule. But then Jesus says, this is the law and the prophets. This phrase needs to be compared with Matthew chapter 22 and verse 40 regarding the two greatest commands to love God and to love others. In this one, Jesus says, on these two commandments depends the whole law and the prophets. The golden rule is the law and the prophets. The two greatest commands is the basis of the law and the prophets. So get the picture. The foundation of the law is love for God and love for others. 
making the golden rule the operational system of the law. It is the system of how it operates. So the principle, the basis is love God, love others, but how does that work? The operation system is the golden rule. Love is the foundation or basis on which everything rests. The practical application is to treat others as we want to be treated. Could this be because we understand love best on the level of self-love? We love ourselves and know how we want or need to be treated. When we treat others this way, we actually need less rules and penalties in this world. The law is internalized and it's not used as a legal code to punish us. This is deep and there's been many people who have tried to unpack this. Perhaps this is why it is said that under the new covenant, the law is written on the heart. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 and following in Jeremiah 31, 31 and following. This commitment to operate out of this rule is absolutely necessary in not becoming like the world. Now look more closely at the rule. Literally, if we were looking at it literally in an interlinear uh, New Testament in the Greek, here's what it would say. All things, therefore, as many soever as ye wish. Well, how would we unravel that? Well, let's look at some of the phrases here. How many and how often do you wish to be treated well by others? Or we might say how much or how often do you wish to be treated well by others? Only 50% of the time? Well, maybe more. Certainly probably not less. At certain times of the day, when the pressure gets to you, when you are carefree, just in certain areas of importance to you, or in the little things too, the orientation is as we wish. This is the question we must answer if we are to capture the essence of this rule. How well do I wish to be treated? And how often do I wish to be treated this way? Well, how would this one rule transform the behavior of the world? A better world certainly begins with me. If this is truly the ground of all the law and the prophets, then how important is it to apply it? Well, time does not permit to review the law and the prophets statement about what that means, along with also the third division, the Psalms, in the Old Testament, which includes history and poetry. But if we were to look at the teachings there in light of this rule, we would find the ethic there. So if you read the Law and the Prophets, the Old Testament, you will find the ethic of the Golden Rule embedded within it. This is not unique to Jesus. He is just validating it by including it in his sermon. An easy way to see this is in the treatment of the widows and the orphans and the aliens, particularly as it talks about them in the Old Testament. They are vulnerable and easily taken advantage of. It would be easy to mistreat or neglect them. But is that what we would want if we were in their shoes? How would we want to be treated if we were a widow or if we were an orphan or an alien? To leave the edges of the field unharvested or not? Which one would we want? To heal on the Sabbath day as Jesus did? You remember Jesus says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You know, even then he is hinting at the golden rule. What would you want if you were sick on the Sabbath day? Would you want to be healed? Would you want mercy? This rule deserves to be tried in earnest to see what happens. I bet some will receive it and benefit and others will take advantage of our efforts to treat them as we want to be treated. Well, so I recognize I probably didn't give all of that section as much attention as probably it deserves. Now I want to move into the next section here. This is still in section 54, but it's, it's number eight in this, in this if you're following through A.T. Robertson's outline here. So this brings us into the conclusion of the sermon. 
don't get excited because the conclusion is pretty long. I want to give attention to just a little bit of the conclusion. We're going to talk about the narrow and the wide gate. So I want to read Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few are those who find it. All right. So let's move into this section a little bit. The narrow and the wide gate. Jesus often describes our choices as either or, or black and white. Here is the narrow gate. Here's the wide gate. The narrow is stenos, stenosis. Luke 13, verse 24 uses it when he says, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Okay, a similar word, uh, and I'm not sure I can pronounce it, stenochorea. Stenochorea is found in Romans 2 and verse 9 and is translated as distress. It's a narrow place. Stenosis of the spine is the narrowing of the spine. Romans 8 verse 35, also distress. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 4, Paul commended himself in distresses, in the narrow places of life. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10, Paul Learn to be content with distresses in the narrow points of life because it was an opportunity to learn to lean on Christ and his strength. Another word, stenochoreo, uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing. And then in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, you are not restrained by us, but we are restrained in your own affections. We are narrowed in to your affections. Although he says you're not narrowed in, you're not, you are too broad with your affections, but we are narrowed into having affections for you. All of these are examples of, in various contexts of a narrowing or a tight place. So Jesus speaks of a narrow gate or a narrow way. The word gate is puli, P-U-L-E, used by Jesus in Matthew 16 and verse 18 to refer to the gates of hell or Hades, which will not prevail against his church. It's used in Hebrews 13 and verse 12. Jesus suffered outside the gate of Jerusalem. I doubt too much should be made of the word gate, merely the obvious. Gates are passageways to a road or a room or a space. These are attached to a fence which obstructs access into a place. The gate is the only legitimate access. See John chapter 10 about entering into the sheep pen by the gate or by the door. But some gates are very narrow and difficult to get through. Remember Jesus spoke of the difficulty of a rich man getting into the kingdom of heaven like a camel passing through the eye of a needle. Now that's a narrow passage. We pick our gates. The other, other one is wider and easy to transverse. The word for uh, wide place is the Greek word platea, P-L-A-T-E-I-A, -E -E similar to plateau, a wide place, perhaps uh, as compared to a narrow mountain pass, there is a broad plain that is easier to pass through, but may not be the best route to your destination. The mountain pass, though hard, may be the better choice to getting to your destination. And that may be what Jesus has in mind, at least to some extent in this, is, is that the broad plain, in fact, like the plain of Megiddo, was a place of battle. And so some of the places that might be the more direct route to uh, a particular area might be the narrow passes uh, through the mountains. The whole idea of being made narrow, to press hard upon. It's the idea of pressing hard upon something, like on grapes. 
a compressed way, a narrow way, a straightened way, a contracted way. Mark 3 and verse 9, the crowd was crowding him on or pressing in on him. Or in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 6, we are afflicted for others' comfort and salvation. In other words, we are pressed in in order for other people to have more comfort. So I will take a limited space so that you can have a broader space. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8, but not crushed. So that, or we are not constricted to the point of being crushed. In 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5, afflicted on every side, conflicts without and fears within. All of these have this idea of the narrowing or the constricting. Paul warns these new converts that they would suffer affliction. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, and 7, affliction repaid is repaid with affliction. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 10, the widow who has assisted those who are in distress or who, those who are in narrow ways. The faithful of Hebrews 11 and verse 37 were, among other things, afflicted. And that's our word, the narrow way. Life is made narrow. We get hemmed in with responsibilities. We have concerns and cares and obligations and fears and dangers and conflicts and difficulties and stuff that tends to crush us into a very narrow place. Many will not accept this narrow place. They want to keep their options open. They want freedom to choose their own way. They want to be flexible because obligations restrict life. Let's not get too narrow in our beliefs and our commitments. Let's not allow others to impose too much on us. Have an escape plan. Resist distress caused by commitments to God and others. Life is made narrow by God who calls us into situations that compress us and, ir and ironically free us to be who we really are, conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, this is one of Jesus' ironies. We are compressed so that we can expand. We are contained so that we can experience freedom. The wide gate is broad and leads to destruction. Wide, as in a street, and again, it is akin to the word platus, P-L-A-T-U-S. Do we get the word duck, duck bill platimus from this? Because I suppose the bill is broad. So you see where we get a lot of these words. Uh, in um, Matthew 6 and verse 5, hypocrites love to stand and pray in the street. They love to pray in the wide way in order to be seen. As opposed to Jesus in Matthew 12 and verse 19, his voice will not be heard in the wide way or in the street. Although in Luke chapter 13 and verse 26 does say that Jesus taught uh, in their streets. Now this is where the master sets his slaves to find people to fill the house. Go at once into the streets, into the wide areas, and find people to come into my house. In Acts 5 and verse 15, the sick were carried into the streets to be healed by Peter. We should not make too much of these uses of the word. I like to use 2 Corinthians 6, 11 and 13, where Paul instructs us to open wide our hearts. This makes an interesting picture. Instead of walking the broad path to destruction, we open our hearts wide to receive and give the love and affection that we were designed to give. Now the word destruction, which is at the end of the broad uh, wide way, uh, is apolia, a-P-O-L-E-I-A. It means ruin or loss or it means to die. It means perdition, something that's wasted, to destroy fully, exclusion from the eternal kingdom. Matthew 26 and verse 8, the waste, he talks about the perfume that was poured on Jesus' feet. You know, it was, it was destroyed. Uh, in uh, John chapter 17 and verse 12, Judas is called the son of perdition. He's the son of destruction. In Romans 9, 22, the vessels of wrath are prepared for destruction. Philippians 1, 28, Paul tells them not to be alarmed by their opponents. 
The lack of alarm will be a sign of their coming destruction. Why fear what is being destroyed and can't hurt us? And then in Philippians 3, verse 19, it says their end is destruction. In 2 Thessalonians 2, and verse 3, the man of lawlessness is called the son of destruction, like Judas, the son of perdition. And Paul warns in 1 Timothy verse, chapter 6 and verse 9, but those who want to get rich fall into a trap or a temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge them into ruin and destruction. And then in Hebrews 10 and verse 39, we do not shrink back to destruction. We are those who have faith to the persevering of our souls. 2 Peter 2, verse 1, false prophets bring destruction on themselves. So in 2 Peter 2, and verse 3, it says their destruction is not sleeping. The word is found in 2 Peter 3, and verse 7. The world is being preserved or reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. It's used in verse 16. Men distort scriptures to their own destruction. And then in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8, the beast is going to destruction. You'll find the same in verse 11 of Revelation 17. So the opposite to destruction is life. So at the end of the narrogate is life. Well, it's Zoe, Z-O-E, a very common word for life. In Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9, Jesus speaks of cutting off limbs and plucking out eyes it's better he says to enter life maimed than for the entire body to be thrown into eternal fire and in matthew 19 verses 16 and 17 the rich young ruler is asking how to have eternal life that's zoe to enter life he says keep the commandments matthew 19 verse 29 the one leaving property and family for his name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. In Matthew 25 verse 46, the ones who will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The gospel of John has at least 32 references to life the New Testament primer on what life really is. I'll just give you an overview of this. Jesus is the source of life, and I will, I'm not going to take time to give you all the scripture references, but all of this is found in the book of John. Belief in Jesus is essential to having life. Disobedience causes us to miss life. Spiritual water or the Holy Spirit becomes a spring of eternal life in us. The worker reaps fruit of eternal life. Uh, there will be a resurrection of life. The life of Jesus becomes life in us. The Spirit, through words, gives us life. To love life is to lose it. And to lose it is to save it. So the definition of life is to know the Father and know the Son. The narrow way opens up for us a whole world of meaning about true life. The choice becomes clearly contrasted. Few find life. That's a sad statement. Do we really know what and how to look for it? The previous list sure is a good start to understanding life. If we go back in the book of John, and study life in just in that book is a good place to start. In my Jeremiah class, this was back in 2012, there was a statement that captured my attention. God says to Jeremiah, If you return, then I will restore you. Before me you will stand. And if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. They, for their part, may turn to you. But as for you, you must not turn to them. Now, that's in Jeremiah 15 and verse 19. The NIV says, If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. The New American Standard Bible is more literally. Certainly, these people were engaged in much worthless chatter. 
and to find the truly worthy words among the chatter would set Jeremiah apart from the people. But to do this, Jeremiah would have to pan for gold. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like our day. There's a lot of words being spoken, but if we're going to find any true words to keep, we're going to have to pan for those words like gold. Life is like this. So much is meaningless and vanity. As Solomon wrote, searching for life that is truly life often gets sidetracked into exciting yet ultimately worthless pursuits. Jesus recognized that man, that, that most would just not get it. Life would first and foremost be found in him, and he alone could give meaning and purpose to our, our other pursuits in life. Uh, the author uh, Peck made an attempt to explain this in The Road Less Traveled, that book. But life is not first a lifestyle, it is a person. A life that is on the moral high ground or filled with love or with nonviolence or with world peace or justice or some other principle, even those reflecting the heart and character of God without true belief in Jesus are hollow shells, noble and helpful in this life, but empty of the real power and connection because knowing Jesus and the Father are not uh, because those who do this are not knowing Jesus and the Father, who is, which is the primary pursuit of our lives. He is life. He is the formula for life. He alone can infuse life into us in mysterious ways. Jesus must be first. He is not garnish on the plate. He is the ground of life. The gate is so narrow to find him. Who will attempt to squeeze through the gate? I just noticed that Jesus depicts the gate as being wide and small and the way on the other side as being broad and narrow. Why do few find the small and the narrow? Is it that they do not find it or merely do not recognize it and choose it? Some are blind and simply can't see the gate. Others see it but do not think it is a valid path. They think it's dead end. They think it's unfulfilling but it is, in fact, the path that leads to life. Well, we're going to stop there today uh, and We've got more to got go uh, before we end the Sermon on the Mount. So thank you again for joining us on this occasion. You can find all of our materials on our website, centralsarasota.org, and I hope that you will go there and avail yourself of other studies that we have done and even archive sermons that we've done on Sunday morning. But thank you for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. God bless.